Good morning, thank you for coming. Uh, today's training is on the state inventory management program that we're currently implementing. Um, a lot of our new documents are dated November 29th because that's the effective date of the tag instruction that's causing all these issues to happen. We are formalizing our inventory due to some losses and due to several requirements by the state and by National Guard Bureau that we have not accomplished in the past. And since we've lost a few significant items recently, um, General Reiner wants us to implement this thorough program. Um, I will begin with, once we start doing something that we've never done before, it takes a lot of man hours. It's going to take a lot of man hours to do the, to do the, to do the paperwork to keep track of everything. So we're going we're gonna to overview our documents um, in priority order. And now, not your, your books are not in this order, but once we get into the slideshow, um, the slideshow is in the order in the book. Okay. So we're going to review the tag instructions. We're going to review the state's uh, capital asset guide, and that's from the state to the agencies. We're going to review an excerpt from NGR 5-1, which is for all cooperative agreements. We're going to review our uh, state military affairs asset management policy, which is a short paragraph, and then the asset management procedures that implement that policy. And these are for capital and non-fixed. So we have three different categories that we're going to go over. Capital um, and non-fixed assets, we're really concerned about the non-fixed assets, okay? And then we have a third category that is supplies, warehouse type items and supplies. And so we're going to start inventorying everything to a degree. And then we're going to focus on this non-fixed asset guide. And we're, we're, we're going to briefly touch on everything. We are not going to teach line by line how to fill out forms. They're pretty self-explanatory, but when it comes to filling out those forms, you need to do one-on-one -on -one training with Tanya or, or over the phone with Tanya in, in order to make that happen. And, and they're pretty simple. Going to review uh, disposal of non-fixed assets. We're going to review the warehouse supplies management guide. And you'll notice a difference in your book. But um, I am using supplies grammatically incorrect it should be supply but supply in the military talks about the full spectrum of supply and that entire operation what i'm focusing on is the actual end product that we're that we're accountable for and in this case we're not going to monitor that we're going to push it down to the program managers to keep track of their purchases during the year, and then do an annual inventory to find out what, what supplies we have on hand at the end of the year. So, and then that's gonna go on a report, and then we get involved in just passing that report up to senior management. Wyoming Administrative Regulation, 230-1, um, this is the Army Guard uh, implementation of management of armories around the state. The Air Guard doesn't have a similar form um, because you're located at a single base. It is really a senior management structure that makes that um, operation exist. For example, uh, use of our armories, this goes into use and documentation of use and those kind of things. We're going to touch on that briefly, but again, that's not the focus of this training. I just want to push it out there. And then a state of Wyoming vehicle use policy and procedures. And then a current document that we have in a draft stage that the uh, state attorney general and the USPFO have already agreed to. It's under review with, uh, with our JAG office uh, before the TAG and the PFO sign off on it. But it, it covers both state employees using federal equipment and federal employees using state equipment. And then we have some forms. Here are my department's forms. So we have a 
new building addition form, and of course that's for the capital side of the house. Um, the only two programs that really um, use that are the Construction Facility Management Office for the Army National Guard and the Civil Engineer Office uh, for the Air National Guard. State Inventory Management Form, this is the primary form that has to be filled out for everything above $100 that gets put on the inventory. Hand Receipt, this is a new document. Uh, the body of it is a generated spreadsheet, but that hand, re this is, and we're calling it a primary hand receipt, but that is a document that comes from Tanya, from my office, to every program manager, and the program manager then is held accountable for all those items. And we're implementing this similar to the military system, where a commander signs for all of his property, and that commander's goal, ultimately, is to subhand receipt everything on that list to somebody else all the way down to the end user. That, and then we have the subhand receipt form. Now, this is a, a uh, finite form that we're providing that could be filled in by hand. Um, however, since it's the responsibility of the program manager to accomplish that, you can work with Tanya to use an electronic spreadsheet to embed in that if that list is long enough. Okay. And then a training certificate. And so we have separate training certificates and the, the, the original training certificate is in your folder in the front sleeve. And unlike other training certificates that you may be used to, this training certificate has to be signed off by you, by your supervisor, and by the program manager because the program manager is the one that's responsible for ensuring that all the people on his subhand receipts have had this training. Okay, We're responsible to provide it, but the program manager is responsible for getting it done. And then we have state level uh, property accountability uh, doc, uh, uh, forms. Um, and this is correctly spelled, sellable property goes on when we turn it into state surplus. And virtually everything is trackable, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, property disposal request, and this, and, and the hyphens are in the right place, a PP-4 and a PP-4-C. And you just need a separate form for all electronic items. Where we have a supply, of a mouse or a, a keyboard um, that don't have to be tracked other than as a supply. They have to be turned in on this document because they're still electronic and we have to dispose of them properly to keep that out of our landfill and those, those kind of things. And then we have a certificate of destruction. Next three slides are excerpts from the tag instruction. And so without looking at the tag instruction, you can, you can jump in that if you want to. But these are just the next three paragraphs. In this form, I've bulletized them to try to segregate out the thought process. And so the tag is telling me and my office that we have to implement this program. We have to hold individuals accountable at the program level. That's my responsibility. And that's holding them account account uh, accountable physically and financially. And then we have to... Um, Look at these areas, okay? So expendable type items, we'll get into that, but these are the supplies. These are the warehouse items and supplies. Life cycle cost dates, or life cycle dates. Our inventory has estimated life cycle dates when we make a purchase on them. However, we're not training that because if it's anything down to $100, you have to come to my office, to Tanya specifically, for disposal of that $100 item. You have no authority to say, that's a five-year lifespan on that, and I can throw it away after five years. You, you're not allowed to do that. So in this case, and this really gets into vehicles more than anything, but now the state, if you have a state vehicle where it used to be 80 to 100,000 miles, we'd turn those in, get a new one. Um, most of our vehicles we own outright, so we don't fall under that rule. But right now, and, but we try to follow it. Um, and right now, um, the state is pushing 150,000 miles and really no age limit on them at all. 
So, um, again, we're not going to go into that too much. Disposal for non-fixed state assets. And then that goes through those forms, really completing the forms and ensuring, you know, that we're, we're turning it in. Um, might touch briefly on vehicles. Well, I'll wait until we get to the vehicle slide. Um, and then this is the tag's intent. Goes back to uh, people are accountable. When it says program manager, it's talking about the program manager, okay? The actual program manager. And in the, and in the cooperative agreement world, that is the people that are on the books and sign off with that authority to a letter from the USPFO. Accountable officer is anybody, and let's not think military officer here, that's everybody in the chain of hand receipts from the program manager all the way down to the end user. You are. That's what I thought. So you and, you're, and you're the program manager over every one of your sections. Right. They're not segregated. Right. And then I do the sub form for them. Correct. And then Bob will do the sub form for every computer that his folks have. Correct. So, so am I the program manager? You are the program. Well, no, you're not. Colonel Campbell is your program manager. And so it's how, how she looks at it. Now, I don't know. There is another military person that she has that, that keeps the books. Is that correct? The person that we send the reimbursement documents to. There's another individual in the military chain that does that, an, an NCO, I think. And I don't know if that person is going to be in their chain of command. It's up to them. Because the ultimate goal, if something ends up missing at any level, I'm expecting the program manager to pay for it. I don't care how many people are in that chain. The next issue then is, do they have proper chain of custody in hand receipts all the way down to that individual? And then if they do, then that individual is responsible for it. So she will be the program manager? She is the program manager. In, in cooperative agreement world, um, only a federal employee can be a program manager. So The next paragraph, the, the second paragraph of importance in the TAG instruction is that now that program managers are accountable for all their stuff, they're responsible to do 100% inventory annually. They're responsible to certify that off and send that certification back to me. And then Tanya will go out and do another, a second 100% inventory annually as an audit. We'll send those lists out a month in advance, approximately May 1st, if not sooner. If anything ends up missing, the accountable officer, and through that, again, we're gonna, we're gonna give this to the program manager, so whoever is in that delegation order of, su of sub-hand receipts, you have to figure out within seven days what's going wrong, you have to pay for it within 14 days. People will be held accountable, through the HR system, no matter what type of employee you are. So, the question, sub hand receipts. Uh, so that there needs to be a receipt that Campbell signs off, or I sign off on for every um, property that we have, correct? Correct, so the question was um, that as, as the primary uh, supervisor, the director of the challenge program, since Colonel Campbell is the program manager, he'll have to sign off from her. He will have the first hand receipt, most likely, unless she has another military person in between you, probably not. She will have you sign a sub hand receipt that is virtually identical to the primary hand receipt, have everything on it. And then you are going to have a second order and a third order and a fourth order effect when you start signing that down to people. Now you have the ability to sign all your stuff directly to an individual, have all those people on a straight line. I would not recommend you do that. I would recommend you delegate those things to primary supervisors, intermediate supervisors. Then that holds everybody accountable 
And so if you, if you have a, uh, a management um, supervision chain of command of any kind, then those sub-hand receipts should go person by person down through that chain of command. Otherwise, you're skipping people and not holding them accountable. So where do these initial lists come from? I mean, so they have to come from now. Yes. The initial... So we share the economy, give you a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Military department, we, excuse me, the Veterans Commission and financial shares this room. There's a lot of equipment in here. How do we parse that out, or is that something that we have to sit down and agree upon? That's something that we have to sit down and agree upon. So... In, in my world, on this side of the house, and I would hope that you would, but that's an, uh, up for debate, is that once you come through the front door, anybody can access anybody's equipment. I cannot, in good conscience, hold an individual responsible for their property. So basically, I'm gonna own the property. Then the problem, the, then the issue becomes a management issue of when somebody walks in in the morning and says, my computer's gone, then we do a thorough investigation and try to determine any liability. Ultimately, the employee can't be held financially liability if they're not liable if they're not signed for something. Okay? And they cannot sign for something or should not sign for something if they can't secure it, which is going to create a lot of problems when we get out to a, uh, a lot of tool sets that are in one vehicle that you have two people in. One person is going to have to sign for that and understand that when they're working on site, if the other person loses something, they're liable for it. Or, if I'm signing for something, do I allow somebody else to use it? I can't be directed to. So, so the question is, um, when things are purchased, and they're purchased, at, a lot of things are purchased at the end user level if they have a credit card, you do not have to have, it, it depends on your management style in that chain of command, but typically a program manager is not going to have the direct day-to-day -day approval authority of you buying a widget, okay? So there is no reporting this up that chain. We're not directing you to report that up that chain. That's, that's a management issue for that program manager once they find out that they're responsible how they want to handle that, okay? When you buy something down to um, $5,000, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later. I don't want to belabor the point on this slide, but um, ultimately it'll be reported up It'll go on to that, it will, it will make sure that it gets on the inventory list, and the next time that chain of authority sees that is the next annual inventory process. Okay? So at the end user level right now, it's not changing. We are still doing the PP4 frame thing, or not PP4, the VSF2, or anything that comes across that you guys buy. Like if Dakota puts it on her vehicle, she still does it. The same way we have been doing it. So, so again, Tanya followed up with an answer there that if it's over $100, an SF2 has to be filled out. So that's a, that's a uh, anything over $5,000, that's a double redundancy for it because the Wolf's accounting system on the state side forces us to inventory anything over $5,000. Any purchase. I got 18 in there, it's 20 now. So you got 20 tabs that we're gonna review, 20 different documents. And then we'll take questions throughout uh, this program. So the tag instruction, we already went over those Critical three paragraphs. Here's the laundry list of, of uh, documents and forms. 
There's your three paragraphs, A, B, and C, that we just documented. And there's the boss's signature saying he wants to do this. So your next tab is uh, the State Asset Inventory Training Certificate. And again, we're just pointing that out. One that has holes punched in it is not the original. You have the original that you need to sign. You need to go through your chain of command program manager. And then a copy of it. You can mail a copy in. You can scan it and email it in. will be tracked by Tanya. So we're also responsible for tracking all the records for the state. This document is not our document. This is a state level document, auditor's office. This is the capital and non-fixed asset guide. <coughs> and it covers capitalized um, items. Now, this is a differentiation in terminology. The state looks at capitalized items as real property, buildings, grounds, all those kind of things that we're really not focusing on today. But they capitalize non-fixed assets down to $5,000. We are using the terminology non-fixed assets as any non-fixed asset over $100 up to infinity. Could be a quarter million dollar road grader. It's a non-fixed asset. Tanya, would you scroll that down? Just keep on going. Actually go up and drag it all the way to the bottom. Then you have to back it up a little bit. All the way to the bottom. The state's at $500, but we're down to 100 What does that mean the rock window? Okay, we're going to look at that here real quick. Yeah. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? So we're required to have um, asset tags, and we're going to show you a picture of a couple of those. We have state-level asset tags that go down to $5,000, and then anything under $5,000, we put an agency-level uh, tag on. But this is their policy. So their policy basically says, and you can read through it, but it basically says that the system is going to require us to inventory down to items of $5,000. And then we have a responsibility down to $500 to keep a listing of everything we bought. And then we also have the ability, let's, can you scroll that down to just the top of the next page? Yeah. Keep going. And we have the option of adding to the list those items below $500, which they determine walkable. Well, we, we determine everything walkable in, uh, between over $100 and between $100 and $500. So for this purpose and for our agency, everything above uh, $100 is going to be inventoried. And the list really is not that long. The whole, the whole agency list is really not that long. And most of it resides in one or two 
uh, programs. We've already talked about the, uh, and here we have the annual physical inventory as a requirement. You have an excerpt of National Guard uh, 5-1. Would you take us down to paragraph 8? And so these are the requirements for the majority of our equipment um, that is purchased and owned by each program. And so 5-1, and this, and this governs both Army and Air Guard. <coughs> That's, you had it. So paragraph 8-2, equipment use, accountability, and disposition. A, if it's bought through in-kind assistance through the federal procurement system, then we have nothing to do with it. Okay. If it is equipment that is purchased by the grantee, which is the state of Wyoming, if we buy the equipment, then it goes on the state inventory. And then we have to certify to the PFO that we're going to maintain the records. And we have to keep a physical inventory. We have to report it to the US PFO, who is the grantor. And we have to have a control system in place to certify to the grantee that this is in, that, that it's working. We must, um, when we dispose of anything, anything that has a fair market value of in excess of $5,000 that we dispose of, the portion that the federal government paid for the original purchase of that item has to go back to the federal government. Um, and in this case, NGB says it's their money. So technically, it's not even the US PFO's money or the program's money, it's NGB's money. If we buy a vehicle, and this is where we get into a whole lot of different issues, but if we buy a vehicle, typically we use that vehicle for its service life. Historically, we would take them down to surplus and they'll sell them. That money goes back to the general fund unless it's over $5,000. If it's over $5,000, then it comes back to the program. And in most cases, our programs are 100% reimbursed for the items that are purchased. So 100% of the proceeds over $5,000 will go back to NGB. Supplies. So this is, this is uh, probably going to be the most time intensive. We've tried to make it as simple as possible and, and we're not going to inventory it unless, unless through this first procedure, uh, meaning maybe the first or second year of doing this, that will establish whether we need, whether we have a need for this type of inventory in each program individually. A um, couple of the programs, they're going to have to do this forever. But, so what the, what the uh, regulation requires us to do is report a net aggregate uh, amount of supplies that is over $5,000 that was purchased that fiscal year and is available at the end of the fiscal year, but then will not be used for the program. Now I can say that, well, that's never gonna happen. And off, my, off the cuff, I would say every program manager is gonna say that's never gonna happen. But if the PFO says prove it to me, unless you have a process, there's no way to prove that. So, in this case, we're going to establish, and not just because this is a requirement, before this was ever brought to light, the tag required it in his instruction. In his first draft of instruction, he basically wants to know, what are we buying? Where are we buying it? Why are we buying it? You know, and the why always becomes subjective. I mean, we're not reporting why, but the question really is obvious. If it, if it doesn't appear like it should be purchased by that program, why are we doing it? kind of thing. So, use of federal loaned equipment, 
we're going to get into that. And of course, this was, this was uh, referenced. Um, this basically says that the grantee is, is, uh, 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 can use federal equipment. So if we have a federal dump truck at Guernsey, uh, a state employee can drive that to do work. But if the state employee wrecks it, the state's liable for it. So there's a whole process there that, we're going, that, that we've written a document to implement. Okay. Army regulation uh, 735-5. Now we're not using this document um, to manage our program at all. What I've done here is given you an excerpt of some of the terminology that I've used to establish what our agency definition of warehouse supplies are. And that's the only reason for this reference. Since the state doesn't, uh, the state doesn't have a reference and doesn't require us to inventory supplies. Here is my policy. It's a simple paragraph. You can read it. State auditor, risk management, state risk management, PFO are, real, are the real impetus of the requirements for this document, or for this program, I'm sorry. And then these are our procedures. Again, we reference the documents. And then it is um, very short. And you can go, if you go down to the second page, what we're going to do. And so we again talk about the $5,000 level. And I'm not going to belabor it by reading it, but this is really the procedures that we're going to use and then these procedures are implemented under the guide. So you have everything above 5,000, you have everything between 100 and 5,000. We're required to have a validation process. And then we have to establish the use of those facilities or those, those um, end items. And it again, we're talking real property as well as fixed assets. These two documents do not get into supplies. So the chain of, re, uh, the chain of direction for supplies goes directly from the tag instruction to an implementing guide. But what we're mostly concerned about are these non-fixed assets, and that's why we have a policy and procedure on the state, on the state format. This form, very simply, um, doesn't affect any of you, but this is the form that the, the uh, CNFMO in the Army Guard and the CE in the Air Guard have to use in order to keep our inventory of real property current. This is the real document I want you to focus on. I want you to understand every one of them. It's not gonna let me do it again. Tags requiring it. Non-fixed assets to be purchased. We're buying computers. If it has a serial number, if it's over $100, or if it's part of a kit. It doesn't need to be inventoried as a non-fixed asset. If it's a computer keyboard, mice, parts and supplies that are used in other inventoryable type items, 
or assets under $100. Assets under $100 that are highly pilferable can still be put on there. Um, if they're very unique items, I don't think we have very many of those. And you have to submit the following in order to get that to complete this inventory. And that's the invoice, the visa statement, um, if we're using a credit card, and then you have to complete the SF2 form. Then state fiscal will assign um, the asset numbers depending on, on the dollar amount. The annual primary hand receipt, uh, the SF3, will then be given to the program manager. Program manager um, has 45 days from the 1st of May, and we will get it to you no later than the 1st of May, in order to complete their certification. We don't expect the program manager to go out and do a physical inventory, especially if you have stuff scattered all across the state. But um, the program manager would go down through that sub-hand receipt chain and require each one of those people to inventory it and pass it up that chain to sign off on it. Now we've only required two, I think only two signatures, and we'll look at the form. Here is a copy of what the state's inventory tags look like. And so these are very poor quality uh, documents. They're on, they're on paper that when they get wet, they just disintegrate. Um, what you need to do in most cases is take a Sharpie and mark that number on the piece of equipment, whether it's writing it directly on a vacuum cleaner or putting that number under the hood on a vehicle um, because these are these are not very durable at all and we had a question in the last class that we're going to look into but since we don't produce these and these are inventoried by at the state level um, we're probably not going to be able to change them and buy a higher quality deal now what we are going to suggest and 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 try to push for is that the state starts providing higher quality labels because this stuff is not very good. Can you close that and go to the next one? And, and we didn't put copies of these in your deal, but, and then this is what ours look like. Our, our, uh, our labels are actually a lot more durable than the state's lab labels. Go ahead and close that. Okay, warehouse supplies. Let me do it again. I'll have you scroll that down here in a minute. So, again, we're required by NGB to do that over 5,000 that aren't going to be used, but again, you've got to prove that. So to get there, we have to inventory stuff. And then again, I used just referencing that Army regulation on how I got to be, got to a definition. If you'd scroll up for me. Scroll up or down? Well, so I can read it. Here. The state doesn't require accountability of property at this level um, and we establish this guide um, for anything that is in a gross aggregate of five thousand dollars now ignore the five thousand dollars every program is now required to track on a simple spreadsheet we've put a lot of headers on here um, that in most cases by the smaller programs won't be used but you need to, to evaluate whether you need to use these. You need to develop your own spreadsheet, document your purchases, and then put the location on them, and then inventory them at the end of the year. <coughs> Definition. 
warehouse supplies are expendable property that is consumed in use or loses its identity in use, as well as expendable property includes items not consumed in use with a unit cost of less than $100. So again, you're going to be inventorying everything you buy. <clears throat> the only things you won't be inventory when you look at from a budget perspective are services. When you contract for services or buy services, everything else physically that you buy are going to be inventoried in one or another category. And then we have a laundry list of examples. <clears throat> Consumed in maintenance, light bulbs, ballast, oil, paint, fuel, uh, cleaning and preserving materials, supplies that lose their identity, assemblies, repair parts, accessories, supplies consumed by public activities, clothing, and that really gets into the fire department for a lot of clothing. You guys have a lot of uh, clothing in the challenge program. Audiovisual products, training devices, training aids, displays, and then all your office supplies, paper pens, markers, printer copier, ink staplers, hole punches, all of those things. And so these hard items of staplers and hole punches and those kind of things are really going to be on a returning, you're going to be inventorying them because you need to know what they are. Because what's going to happen is the tag's going to look at, well, you bought 10 of these things, you have five people, why, why are you buying 10 of them? Kind of thing. And how many are on hand at the end of the year? You're, we're going to make the assumption that you're going to turn around and say, at the end of the year, well, we're going to use it next year too. We're not going to get rid of it. But that is, is really is going to point at when we buy a screwdriver or we buy a hole punch, why do we need to keep buying those over the years? Specialty, I, I put this on here, this is terminology from the, from the Army Guard reg. Uh, special tooling, jigs, fixtures, templates. So virtually anything you buy has to be inventoried. But anything under $100 is going to go on this supply list that you're keeping. Each state program will do this, or each state funded program will do this and use the state fiscal year. Each cooperative agreement program will use the federal fiscal year, and the challenge program will use their federal program fiscal year. And then when those reports come to me annually, um, then I'll report them up to the senior management council, and the senior management council is the generals and the senior colonels then we'll also provide that list uh, to the grants officer in the PFO, Captain Harris currently, um, who will evaluate whether we're meeting uh, NGR 5-1 requirements with this process. Again, we're not going to teach these forms, but this is the primary form, the SF2. You have that in your book. This is the primary form that, that puts it on the uh, inventory, and we need it filled out for everything above $100. Doug, I'm not, will you be yeah. providing that electronically for us? Providing what electronically? This inventory management form? Um, yeah, that's an, elect yeah, that's an electronic that. document with fill in the blanks. So we have not, we have, so the question was, will we be pr providing this electronically? Yes. Um, for... State programs, we will put it on our state drive. For all of the federal cooperative agreement programs, we're going to get this package built, which we have not finalized yet, and hang it on SharePoint on the Army Guard and the Air Guard side. And so some of the forms are filling the blank, and some of the forms are, are uh, basically an electronic copy, a PDF of a manual form that needs to be filled out. So this is the SF3, and this is an excerpt that Tanya downloads from the inventory a database and just creates a spreadsheet and then pastes it into a, a spreadsheet document with a common header and footer and a signature block. Um, this is an example. Most of these vehicles, I think, exist in the uh, CFMO. Um, but your items will be on there, and you'll hand receipt that down. Okay, close that and go to the next, the subhand receipt, the SF4. 
is just a simple uh, manual spreadsheet. However, just like the other one, um, we can take that, not, not, we'll, we'll give you access to a spreadsheet, probably on a personal request from Tanya, she'll send you the spreadsheet, and then you can take that spreadsheet and divide it out into subhand receipts and, and paste an actual spreadsheet in here um, instead of this table that's in this Word document. Go ahead and close it. Disposal of non-fixed assets. So, I guess I really don't need to get into a whole lot of detail here. Um, the bottom line is anything down to $100 um, needs to be properly assessed and turned in. Um, so when it is a very inexpensive item or it really doesn't work anymore, you contact Tanya directly through an email or, or a phone call. Tanya is going to kick that down to state surplus to find out uh, what they want us to do with it. We're going to tell you what to do with it. Um, they are now trending the other direction of what they've been doing. They're trending back to, we want all your junk. So they can physically look at it and evaluate whether they want to fix it or not and try to sell it. Um, the state the surplus property has went virtually 100% to online sales. So as a state agency or an, as an end user, if programs want stump something from state surplus, if they want to try to get something from state surplus, just go online. But you have to intercept it between the time they post it and the time somebody puts a bid in on it. Um, and then you have to go down and look at it and say, yeah, I want it. So, but they're, they're, uh, they've significant in, increased their sales um, and the amount of their sales by doing this. Vehicles are the best example. Um, they're getting virtually twice as much for the sale of any vehicle at any level uh, than they got when they had a, a manual auction, on-site auction. This goes over the forms that have to be used. So here's your certificate of destruction form. And again, these forms are, are uh, administration and information forms, state forms. So we can't change them or alter them. That's a fill in the blank electronic form. Here is the uh, primary form that you turn in all your property on, the PP4. This is a fill in the blank form for your electronic turn in items. And then uh, Here's an excerpt from the, the uh, war. Would you scroll down to the highlighted area? Paragraph 8 again, I think. <clears throat> this is not um, to do with fixed asset management. I just want to put this out there that all of our facilities, <coughs> we have a report that goes in for use of facilities. Um, it is part of our agency budget strategic plan. So in your world, you may have seen that we do strategic planning as a management process. The state requires the same thing that the federal government requires with regards to those. But everything that you see internally to the state is in the federal format and we use the federal strategic planning process for our operations. But as a state agency, all other state agencies and ours is required to use the state's process. So we do that but internally then we call it the state budget strategic plan because everything we do in the budgeting and execution of, of funds world is tied directly back to each bullet in that strategic plan. 
And so it cannot be in the same format that the federal government has. But what I want to point out here is we've got a significant disconnect that when this new war was published on January 1st of 16, we have yet to be able to track use of facilities. And when it comes to acquiring additional maintenance money to maintain all of our facilities from the state, we're not able to directly indicate to them how much they're being used by the public. And so when this was put into place, it has not been enforced. And so I'm going to try to start enforcing that. But this entire document is for the management of facilities, <clears throat> primarily armories in this JFRC. Um, and then the, uh, the Office of Primary Responsibility is the Construction of Facilities Management Office. So it's not my form. I just want to push out that we did get this put into that document. State vehicle use. I just want to focus on the highlighted excerpt that you got in there. And uh, we can't use our vehicles. For family members, friends, um, or anybody that's not conducting official state business. It has an exception in there that says uh, members of an employee's family participating in state business functions are authorized to ride in a state vehicle with supervisor approval. And I want to tell you that if you are a supervisor, you better be saying no. If you really want to make it happen, then you need to request that through me to the tag. And he'll be the one that determines that. The only example that I have ever seen in our agency that is legitimate was when the previous tag, his wife was a direct volunteer that worked with S first during deployments. And so when the tag would go out to, to you know, give everybody handshakes and, and, and talk to the families and so forth, his spouse would be out there working with us first. And so that was a legitimate uh, travel. But ultimately, that's the tag's call, whatever he wants to be responsible for. Okay, again, um, this is our new document that gives guidance. And so, what I do want to say is that right now, and, and it hopefully is going to be explaining that, we're, we're going to have to teach this in more detail, but I'm not going to go into that now because it's not a final document. I don't know if there are going to be changes to it made. Without this document, a state employee can drive a federal piece of equipment. When the state employee wrecks that piece of equipment, there is a determination whether it was the employee's fault. Okay? Because if it's not the employee's fault, hopefully the other party is going to pay for it. But if that person is a non-insured person, um, then the federal government's got to fix their vehicle, and they're going to make the state pay for it. Okay? Now, the state will pay for it, okay? But if it's your fault, if it's our employee's fault, we have a deductible on vehicles especially uh, of $2,500. So when a cooperative agreement program employee wrecks that vehicle, then you have to look at the program appendices to determine whether or not that program can pay for that deductible. In most cases, they don't. And then the state's going to be 100% liable for that $2,500 deductible. But I'm here to tell you that I'm not going to pay for that. Okay? And so when I do pay for it, we're going to obviously fix the vehicle, then I'm going to come back to the individual. Now, actually, I'm going to ask the Attorney General and Risk Management what they want to do, okay? Or the TAG. 
And if the tag says I'm going to pay for it, then I'm going to go to a state program and steal money from that state program and pay for it. If the program itself cannot pay for it. Conversely, if a federal employee is driving a state vehicle, hopefully this remedies or at least puts the knowledge out there of what the consequences are. But if a state or a federal employee is driving a vehicle and has an accident and it's their fault, the state will fix its own vehicle and then sue the federal employee. This agreement says who the responsible parties are. Okay? Today, if you're a federal person driving a state vehicle, I hope that you have USAA because that's about the only insurance that for almost no money, and you've got to buy a rider, that will insure a business vehicle. That when you work for somebody, they will insure the business vehicle. And um, so because you don't want to be liable if it's your act, if it's your, if it's your fault. So anyway, those are kind of the, uh, the direct issues involved with vehicle use. And so once this is put in place, then uh, we'll, we'll make sure that that's, uh, that's put out there. We'll, uh, again, today, um, that was our last slide. And so I thank you for coming. We're almost right on the hour mark. We have videoed this, uh, this session, and we'll look at that. Our intent is to hang that video out on SharePoint. Um, and as well as a packet of documents so that you can use both. Um, we may in the future upgrade that to a better training document that's just everything embedded in a PowerPoint with voiceover. But right now, that's what we're, this is what we're aiming at. And so do we have any more questions? Just one quick one. My subordinates, my program manager for my service officers, museum, records, Everybody down to the end user require, is going to be required to have this training. So as just rule of thumb, I've got about 200 people to train. Uh, we've trained seven people and looks like six people. So I've got 13 people to 200 trained that I'm supposed to have trained in 90 days. That was, I, I didn't talk about that. Um, the tag requires us to train everybody within 90 days of the publish, publishing of his instruction or 90 days of becoming a new employee. I did get him to accept that uh, in the email that I put out to everybody, uh, program managers now have the ability to come back to us as soon as possible, hopefully, so that we can schedule training at your location. And that has to be completed before the end of March. So that's 120 days out. But with the holidays and everything, I think that's, that's doing pretty good. Because this whole thing doesn't get implemented. Now, let me, let me go back to two issues. Write these down, Tanya, would you? So implementation of supplies is effective at the beginning of the federal fiscal year this year effective on July 1st of next year for the beginning of next biennium for the state programs. And the inventory process is effective as of the day before May 1st when we send out the first primary hand receipts for the next year. And we really need to get everybody trained before then. And so it's very difficult for you to hold anybody accountable through a hand receipt process if they've not been trained because they could claim I'm not liable. As well as if a person intentionally avoids training to not be held liable and not receive a hand receipt, that's another issue. But again, that's the requirement of the program managers in order to make sure that they're, all of their people down to the end user are trained. But we'll do the training. So what I can do is get with you offline? Yep. And, and so what is happening for the Veterans Commission is that they're going to, during one of their meetings where they have all of their people physically in one place, we'll, we'll conduct the training for them. Um, we are going to export this training. Uh, you know, we know we're going to have a couple classes at the Air Guard. 
we, we know we're going to have a couple classes here in the building for uh, the uh, facilities management office, and we know we're going to have to have a couple of them up in Guernsey. And so right now up in Guernsey, we're shooting for the week of the 29th of January to have at least one. So, um, and right now I think we're going to be coordinating through, requesting through uh, the camp, but coordinating with you because we want to use the chapel. And I think there's tables and chairs in the chapel that we can use, so. So I'll need, just for clarification, all 45 training, so. Yes, anybody that's going to sign, anybody that's responsible for any inventory equipment. Again, again, uh, one more time, what Tanya had said is, is if you sign a hand receipt, you have to be trained. Well, thank you very much. And that concludes our training. <laughs>